It's fascinating and puzzling to me how some music and some composers languish in obscurity for a long time, sometimes so well after their deaths. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. One such example is Mrs. Laff Weinberg. And thanks to your recordings on the Challenge label, small, very enterprising label, more people are going to be discovering this music. My first encounter with it was his Holocaust opera, The Passenger, which David Pountney did and actually discovered and championed at English National Opera. That piece made a great impression on a lot of people. What was your first encounter with his music and why did it speak to you? It was in the same year that The Passenger was staged in Bregenz ah. at the Opernfestspiele. And I remember seeing the poster for it and I was wondering what composer that is. I never had heard the name. And more or less in the same time, a cellist friend who runs his own uh, chamber music festival in Bavaria, he asked me and uh, my pianist, Jose Gallardo, to join him for a trio concert at his festival. And as he was the director, he was the one to decide what would be played. And mm. one of the pieces was the piano trio by Mieslav Weinberg. Mm. This was my first encounter with the composer and I remember I was completely in awe of this music from the very beginning and that was the start. Can you describe what it was about the music that connected with you? On the one hand his music has an impeccable force and drive that I found fascinating but then on the other hand you have this transparency and beauty in his melodies that I found really unique. Mm. And I didn't know anything about Weinberg's life mm. when I played this trio. And only in the process then of mm. playing more pieces by Weinberg, I read his biography, I found out about his life. And then things became more clear uh -huh. why his music is so deep yeah. and so touching. It's an extraordinary story, isn't it? I mean, it's stranger it than fiction. I mean, this whole idea of the interruption of his studies in Warsaw, the flight to Russia with his family. Now, tell us, was it just his sister that was with him or other members of the family that decided to turn back? I think it was Warsaw? his sister and uh, his parents who decided uh, we will probably not make it. And so they decided to go back to Warsaw. <sighs> and Mieslav Weinberg, he continued his trip to the Soviet Union. And they never saw each other again. He only found out in the 60s what happened to his close family that they were killed in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Until then, sure, he, he made assumptions mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. probably rather clear, but there was never the confirmed fact what, what happened. And there you have right there what shaped his life yeah. and his music. <laughs> Shostakovich was key in his salvation and on the strength of the score of was it Weinberg's first symphony organized an official invitation to Moscow and that was the first step of actually putting his past behind him but it wasn't the end of the problem and of course there were more problems to be had in in Russia itself oh, yes. at that time yeah. which was, everything was changing Weinberg wrote or quoted I'm a pupil of Shostakovich although I've never had lessons with him I count myself as his pupil, his flesh and blood. It's an interesting remark, isn't it? It is interesting, and maybe this was also a part of the fact that he didn't get all the attention he deserved from the beginning. Because if you say, I'm a pupil, and even didn't study, people could also think, okay, so he's like not as good as the master himself. Mm. 
certainly Shostakovich influenced Weinberg's compo composing oh, yes, yes. style. This much is clear. Much evident in the but movie. we should also not forget that Shostakovich estimated Weinberg's opinion that highly that Shostakovich played most of the pieces before going to print for, for Weinberg. He wanted to have his opinion, he wanted to have his okay. Mm. So this already shows how Shostakovich, how highly he estimated mm. him. Because there was such a, uh, a close connection and Shostakovich so admired the music, do you think there was a danger of Shostakovich overly influencing Weinberg while he was still writing at that time? I'm not sure if Weinberg was so aware of it. Right. But it was clear that Weinberg got influenced by Shostakovich's style of composing. You have, for example, repetitive notes, yes. which is a typical Shostakovich thing. Yes. And harmony-wise, sometimes you you get reminded. Yes. Sometimes it's quite startling. But yeah. But then suddenly you hear something else. You you have something that only Weinberg could have composed. Yeah. I do think that he found his very own voice. voice. And uh, this is also why I got so fascinated. Yeah. Because one could say, okay, so there's a composer, forgotten, nobody plays his pieces, almost nobody. Why is that? Probably because it's not so good. Probably it's second rate or mediocre. That's not often always the reason, is it? It's, uh, In this case, it's not. No. I think this is first rate music. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to record it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give Weinberg a platform to be better known so people can actually have a more of a complete picture. Mm -hmm. listening to your excellent recordings of the sonatas and they were all new to me and the points we've made about the kinship with Shostakovich is very strong but then there are pieces like the third sonata which really leapt off the page at me because it seemed to me to have such a distinctive voice of its own and a darker piece a more searching piece mm. and particularly in this rather startling and trenchant finale the third movement of that sonata did that piece make a particular impression on you when you played it in the context of the others? The third sonata, yes. I think it is very special. It also has an incredibly deep, profound second movement. And for sure it's one of his great masterpieces. Mm. In seeing the whole context, for me every sonata has a little speciality. Mm -hmm. For example, the first one I often can think of Schubert's transparency in melodies. It's very young, he was very young, and it feels very young. When you play, you feel, you feel young yourself. <laughs> the second one, for example, the last movement has something from Prokofiev. Then there's the third we just uh, talked about. The fourth reminds me very much of Shostakovich, especially the fast movement. So every, every sonata has yeah. something special. Um, and this, there's the sixth sonata. Which you didn't know existed at one point, did you? Yes, this was very exciting because I got in touch with the publisher to get all the music of the, I thought, five sonatas, Sonatina, Rhapsody and Pieces. And suddenly I get this email, so would you also be interested in having the music of sonata number six? And I didn't know there is a number six. So it was not in print yet when we started rehearsing it and recording it and so he sent it to me as a pdf <laughs> i printed it out and it was wonderful and the great thing about this sonata is that it's completely different than all the other five he composed it 29 years later than number five mm -hmm. and it's dedicated to his mother and i think it was his way of closure of closure and of dealing with the pain that he felt still so many years after the death of the mother in the concentration camp. You 
obviously find this music very satisfying to play, but someone who knows nothing about this composer, is there one thing that you would say to them to sell this music to them? You know, it's not the kind of music after the last chord makes you jump on your chair and scream bravo. Hmm. It has moments that would do that, but usually he ends in a morendo, in a piano pianissimo, fading, away. fading yes. out, and then often the audience is left with maybe even a question mark. So you want to hear the next piece to... Exactly. Where that yes. might be yeah. going. Yeah. But it is always a very touching experience to listen to Weinberg. Mm. Now, Linus, you are demonstrating that musicians have a responsibility, I think, to help determine what gets performed, how the repertoire keeps growing. Otherwise, we'd be living in a museum, really, a musical museum. I know you feel strongly about this and yes. choose your repertoire very carefully. Tell us some of your discoveries, some maybe surprises that you will spring upon us in the future. One you shared with me, which I haven't yet had the chance to hear, the um, uh, Mieszkowski violin concerto, which I didn't know existed. But tell us um, why you feel so strongly about expanding the repertoire. I think it's our duty as a musician. We should serve the composers. And it is up to us to bring music on stages and to bring it to audiences. And if we decide that we should play something because we strongly feel about it, mm. then we have to do it. And mm. it's up to us, musicians, to convince concert organizers to program these pieces. Now with Weinberg, I, I feel this very special connection. Miaskowski is another piece I would love to, to play and perform. And I'm finding out more or less on a weekly basis <laughs> more and more about composers I have not heard myself of, which I find interesting. Which doesn't mean that I would forget Mendelssohn, Brahms, Mozart, no, of Beethoven, course not. and of course. so. Yeah. Are you always on the lookout for young composers with something to say as well? Yes, I am. I, I just commissioned a piece by an Israeli young composer, a friend of mine, Matan Porat. Very interesting music that I really liked. And um, I just played James Macmillan's piece from Ayrshire. Oh, you must play the violin concerto. That is a cracking piece. And I'm looking forward to mm. having the music in my hands of this piece. Mm -hmm. mm. With a small label like Challenge, you're able to somehow dictate or g it gives you freedom of choice. You're able to say, look, um, Much this is so. repertoire that isn't recorded. Because there are collectors out there who are hungry for new material and, and pieces that they don't hear every day. I hope so, that they are hungry for <laughs> Weinberg. <laughs> just recorded the violin concerto of Weinberg yes. and coupled it interestingly with the Britain violin concerto. Let's talk about the Britain first. It's a piece that has gained currency hugely in recent times. Mm -hmm. It was rarely played at one time. Perhaps because it's slightly uncharacteristic piece, it's, it's um, very atmospheric, very searching, very strange, very dark some of it. It was also the influence on Britain of the Spanish Civil War was enormous. He, he, it deeply affected him, and there are quite a few Spanish elements in it, aren't there? There are. It is uh, very interesting, <coughs> because he took so many things from other styles. You have these extremely dark moments that do reflect on the Civil War, and I thought it goes very well together with the Weinberg mm -hmm. because it has these dark moments which Weinberg has as well. Because it somehow has to do with war, both of the pieces. Basically, I think one could say that every piece of Weinberg somehow <laughs> got influenced by the war. Yeah. Because how was, could it not? How could it not? Yes. There is a main theme in the Britain which... Um, is almost like a slow habanera, like a slow Spanish dance, which is both seductive and sinister. Mm -hmm. 
And this makes a journey through the piece. The influences are clear. I mean, there's, there's, there are elements of Berg in the piece. Britain much admired that violin concerto. Certainly Shostakovich, where there was a deep, real kinship. And there's one passage that springs to mind where, in the first movement, where the violin goes into a kind of strange no-man's land, way up in the highest reaches, and then from below... You have this to... chord before the theme yes. re-emerges. It's an amazing moment, that, isn't it? It is. Pure Shostakovich. Yeah. Pure Shostakovich, it's one of these moments where you have to hold yourself together when standing on stage. Because, you know, us as performers, we have to think, or let me give you an example, the clown who makes you laugh, he's not laughing himself. We are touched when playing this, but we, we are the ones who have to transmit it to the audience. So... It's not up to me to start crying on this, but it would be the right place. Now, the Weinberg Concerto seems to me, you talk about war and the, the presence always of, of war in his life, but it seems to me to be a much more bracing, open, optimistic work in many respects. That's the impression I got from the first movement anyway. Yes, from the first movement especially. I mean, already the beginning has this optimistic energy. It grabs you from the beginning. This is what I really like about the first movement. There are these two middle movements. The second one is like a bit like a waltz, but it's not a happy waltz. The third movement I see as the heart mm. of the concerto. It's one of the most beautiful melodies I think Weinberg wrote. Oh, undoubtedly. Ravishing. Heart Took me completely by surprise, because in all the other pieces that I've heard you play, this was a melody that seemed to belong somewhere else. It's not from this world. No. Yeah. yeah. And surprisingly, he ends with the fourth movement, which is, again, has this energy drive from the first movement. Yes. But typically for Weinberg, he ends the concerto not with a big bang. He ends again fading out and leaving us lonely. That's an interesting characteristic, isn't it? That he, he chooses to end his pieces, yes. as you said, with a question mark. Do you think the Weinberg Concerto is going to become core repertoire at some point? Because when Mahler was alive, people w were not really performing the music as much. He was, but I think of works like the Barber Violin Concerto, which people don't uh, didn't right. play, but now everybody plays. Well, I hope that this CD will help, that it will become core repertoire. I think... The piece is made to be played on stage and have an amazing success. I have not found yet any orchestra or conductor to program it, but I hope also that my recording will help so people now can listen to it and mm. make up their mind at least. Mm. And you're very persuasive. I can be quite stubborn. Linus, you are professor of the Leopold Mozart Center of Augsburg University. You work with lots of young players. What is the most important message you like to communicate to these players? Um, and maybe even what are some of the, the, the most common problems and issues that you encounter today with young players? 
I would say that there is no such thing as one problem that many people have. Every case is very particular, very special, and I'm trying to see all of my students in a way, everybody has his own hmm. way, own problems to solve, and own personality. And therefore, I'm giving my very best not to treat everybody the same. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I re always remember Nigel Kennedy saying that one of the problems he had with the Menuhin school was that Menuhin, he, he felt that Menuhin wanted to mould everyone in his own image. Oh, really? That is that interesting. Was, and, and, and Nigel rebelled against that. Yes, I understand what he means very well. I studied with Sacha Bronn for five years, and I was rather young. I was 15. And it was a wonderful experience to once go through the school of Russian violin playing. I would say, actually, I'm a purely bred Russian violinist <laughs> when it comes to that. When I turned 20, I felt that I wanted to do more my own thing, finding more my own voice. And then I went to Anna Chumachenko, who became my teacher. And she was wonderful. She really put me on my own track, gave me a little push, <laughs> and she helped me really to find myself. Do you eat, sleep and breathe music, Linus? Do you have time for anything else in your life? <laughs> I must say that music is my biggest love and there's probably not much time left other than spending it with music in some way being it thinking about a new program or finding new repertoire. So this is not practicing the violin, it's more sitting in front of the computer, but also has to do with music. Mm -hmm. What I love is uh, playing chamber music with friends. Ah. So I, I combine music with being with friends. Do you have a, a, a musical philosophy, if you like, or philosophy as a musician that you live by, a creed, if, if you like? If I had to put it in one sentence, it would probably be that I love every note with all my heart. Mm -hmm.